organizers for inviting me. I'm going to talk about locally testable codes and L1 embeddings of Cayley graphs. And naturally, I'll start by defining what all these objects are. So, you know, this is day four of the workshop. I don't need to define a local tester, but I'm going to do it anyway. We're going to be talking about local testers for binary linear codes, right? So, if I have an NKD linear code, a local tester for it is basically a very efficient algorithm which decides membership in the code. We want it to read very few coordinates in the code, accept something which is a code word, and reject things which are sufficiently far away. Now, a very nice early result in this area, due to Ben Sasson, Harsha, and Rashkornikova, says that the natural testers you can think of are as general as you could hope for. They say that a local tester is essentially a distribution on low weight dual code words. So dual code words are basically the equations that code that things in the code should satisfy. They're saying that what your tester should do is come up with some nice distribution on these dual code words and then just sample from that distribution, check if the received word satisfies this equation. If it does, then accept, otherwise reject, right? Such a test is obviously going to accept code words. The question is whether it's going to reject things which are far away. So formally, uh, and I should mention that this notion of locally testable code it has a long history going back to work on PCPs and program checking and so on. It was <coughs> defined in these works of Blum, Luby, Rubenfeld, Rubenfeld, Sudan, and Friedel Sudan. Formally, a tester for an NKD linear code it queries coordinates according to some distribution D on dual code words. Now, usually the definition of local tester requires that you don't read too many coordinates, which is that the weight of the dual code word is small. I'm going to work with a slightly different definition, which is essentially equivalent. So for the purposes of this talk, let's just assume that these two definitions are the same. I'm going to require my tester to be epsilon smooth, where epsilon smooth means that you query any coordinate in the code with probability at most epsilon. So how do you match this notion up with the standard notion of a tester which reads a few coordinates? Well, if you're reading only Q coordinates, where Q is some constant, then that corresponds to the smoothness parameter being something like O of 1 over N, where N is the length of the code. Right? So why am I doing this this way? Well, you'll see in a while. Right? So now, OK, so now we have a tester which is smooth. What is the soundness requirement? Well, because you're reading just each coordinate only with probability epsilon, if something is at distance 1 from the code, you're only going to reject it with probability epsilon. But what you'd like is that as things get further and further from the code, the probability of rejection goes up. Ideally, by the time the distance is something like d over 4, you want this probability to be an absolute constant. And you could just say that this is your soundness requirement. Or more ambitiously, you could require that actually, as things get further away, the probability of rejection increases linearly with distance from the code. Sorry, so d is the minimum distance? d is the minimum distance of the code, yeah. Oh, so, just, so the equivalent sort of means that if in the dual code we have no low weight, uh, no low weight elements, then you cannot expect, hope to have. Then already this earlier result which we talked about says that such codes are not locally testable. So even this, you have to have a distribution on low weight code words right. so that it's smooth. but Otherwise, the code is just not testable. OK, so my notion of, dis of uh, soundness is going to be the following, that if something's at distance d prime, then the probability of rejection is some delta times d prime. right? So this delta here is going to be the soundness parameter for the tester. And one of the nice things about defining it this way is that these quantities, epsilon and delta, they should be roughly of the same order of magnitude. What do I mean by that? Well, delta has to be smaller than epsilon. This you get just by considering code words at distance 1, right? because the probability of rejection is at most epsilon. And you'd really like delta to be something like epsilon over 10. right? And if we can get that, I'm going to refer to such a tester as a strong tester. All right? So any questions about this definition? All right. So now, as we know, you know, just computing Figuring out the right rate distance trade-offs for linear codes is an open problem. And as you can imagine, when you add in this new parameter, which is locality, then there's even less known. Right? So you know, these are a lot of parameters. So for the purpose of this talk, I want us to focus on two parameter regimes, which are particularly interesting. One is the asymptotically good regime, where the rate and distance, OK, so sorry, the 
rate is k over n, the relative rate, and the relative distance, which is d over n, we want both of these to be absolute constants, right? And this is what is called an asymptotically good curve. Now, an open question, which goes back to the work of Goldreich and Sudan from 10 years back, is whether you can get asymptotically good codes, which are also locally testable. And they asked it for three query LTCs, which is equivalent to asking in our language whether you can have asymptotically good codes where the smoothness is order 1 over n, and they're locally testable. The best we know to date is this result of Dinur, which basically gives us length n, which is k times polylog k. So it's not a constant times k, it's slightly larger, and the relative distance is a constant. Right? Now, another parameter regime, which I consider very interesting, <coughs> but which is probably not as well known, is the case where the distance is just a large constant. Right? So fix d to be some very large constant, like say a thousand. And now we ask the question, as n goes to infinity, how many parity checks do we need if we want the distance to be d and the code to be locally testable? So here, the smoothness parameter I'm looking for is something like 1 over d. If d is a constant, this means I'm allowing you to read something like n over 1,000 coordinates, so some small linear fraction. And I want you to reject things which are at distance d over 4 from the code with good probability. If I didn't have this constraint, this local testability constraint, then the best codes possible are PCH codes, which give you n minus k is something like d over 2 log n. But these are not locally testable because of the absence of low weight dual code words. The best locally testable codes we know come from this work of Bhattacharya et al. They're derived basically from Reed Muller codes, but of very high degree. And here, the number of parity checks is something like log n to the log d, right? And I think a really nice question here is whether you can get BCH-like codes, which are also locally testable, where the number of parity checks is some constant depending on d times log n. You don't have this factor of d in the exponent of the log n, right? And we don't know the answer to this. OK, so this is all I had to say about locally testable codes. And in this talk, I'm going to relate these to some other objects, which are basically Cayley graphs on the Boolean on F2 to the H. Right? So what is a Cayley graph on F2 to the H? Well, the vertices are just all points in F2 to the H. And the edges are given by some subset S of elements in F2 to the H. You have S1 through Sn. And for each vertex x, an element in the set, you have an edge between x and x plus si. Right? So just the standard definition of Cayley graphs. If you take the set S to be E1 through EH, you get the standard Boolean hypercube. We are going to be interested in the case where the number of generators exceeds n. So obviously, these are all sitting in an h-dimensional space. They're not going to be linearly independent anymore. right? They're going to have linear relations among them. So a parameter of interest to us is how independent are they? I'm going to say that this set S is d-wise independent if every subset of less than d elements from the set is actually linearly independent. Right? Again, since they're sitting in h-dimensional space, you want to think of d as something like, say, 0.1 times h or something like that. Right? So I have n elements where n is larger than h. I am looking for every sufficiently small subset of these elements to be linearly independent. So, yeah, yeah, the inequality sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, I have it wrong. You have more generators than the dimension of the space. So I want n larger than h. Sorry for that confusion. Yeah. OK, so what does this mean in graph theory terms that any small subset is linearly independent? right? So I want you to think of it as some kind of analog of a large girth condition. So what do I mean by this? Well, this graph here, just because it's a graph on F2 to the H, it's going to have a lot of short cycles, right? Because cycles in a Cayley graph result when the sum of the H labels sums up to 0. So for instance, just take anything like S1, S2, S1, S2 again, you'll get a cycle, right? But this cycle, it comes about from a trivial relation among the SIs. Right? And these kind of cycles you anyway see in the Boolean hypercube. Now, this has other cycles which come about because of the linear relations between the SIs. But these kinds of cycles are long, basically because the SIs are d-wise independent. 
So if you want a cycle that stems from a non-trivial relation, that will have length at least d. So what device independence tells us about these graphs is that if you look at the d over 2 neighborhood of any vertex, it looks just like the d over 2 dimensional Boolean hypercube, sorry, the Hamming ball in n dimensional space of radius d over 2 because you don't see any cycles that you wouldn't get in the Hamming cube. But yet the vertices are sitting in the space of dimension h which is smaller than n. Right? So locally it looks like an n dimensional hypercube but the vertices are sitting in a smaller dimensional space. Okay, so these are the Cayley graphs that we are interested in. And finally, what is an N1, what's an L1 embedding of a graph? Well, it's just a mapping to vertices in R to the, so I shouldn't call this D, vertices in real space such that the L1 distance approximates the shortest path distance on the graph. Right? So each, each mapping will give you some distortion, which is the approximation factor that you get. And the minimum distortion you can get over all L, overall L1 over all such embeddings, we're going to denote by C1G. It's the, mini it's the best approximation you can have to the shortest path metric using the L1 <coughs> distance on points in Rn. Okay, so now that we've defined locally testable codes, scaly graphs, and L1 embeddings, I can tell you what the main result is, which is that these following objects are equivalents, locally testable codes on one hand, and L1 embeddings of scaly graphs on the other hand. Here's a formal statement of a theorem. If you have an NKD binary linear code with a local tester that gives you smoothness epsilon and soundness delta, that is equivalent to a Cayley graph on F2 to the N minus K, right, which has N generators, which are device independent, and which embeds into L1 with distortion, which is epsilon over delta. Now remember, in our testers, we said that we want, we said that delta has to be less than epsilon, and what we want is that it's not too much smaller, it's something like epsilon over 10. So that's the same thing as saying that this embedding into L1, there is an embedding into L1, which gives you constant distortion, right? So once again, we're looking for Cayley graphs, which have more generators than the dimension, n generators in n minus k dimensional space, they are fairly independent, they are d-wise independent, where d is the distance of the code, and they embed into L1 with small distortion. So when I say the following are equivalent, you can go from a code to a Cayley graph with a good embedding, and vice versa. So the second condition only depends on the ratio between the two? Good, yes. First and one. it turns out that that's the only thing that's important. In a, <coughs> yeah, so actually I'm telling you that give me something which gets the ratio right, I'll give you a good tester where you care about the absolute values. But it turns out that if the ratio is right, then you can boost the absolute values and get them where you'd like them. So, right. so given a Cayley graph, you can pick an epsilon and... Uh, no. no. There is a right value of epsilon, which is roughly 1 over the distance. Okay. And you can get that, provided the ratio is correct. Right? So yeah, this is a good point, but you know, it's, uh, it can be done, basically. Okay, so we are not the first to consider these Cayley graph constructions from our codes, right? A nice paper of Koth and uh, Asaf Naur from 2006, they basically considered these same kinds of Cayley graphs. They didn't state it in this language. They spoke about quotients of the hypercube. But basically what they observed is the following. If you start from a code with large dual distance, you can construct a Cayley graph which is hard to embed into L1. So you can think of our result as building upon this. We're replacing this large dual distance condition with saying that the code is not locally testable, which is a much weaker condition in general. And then we're saying that this is a tight characterization, which means that if you give me a Cayley graph that embeds into L1 with constant distortion, I can build a locally testable code from it. And that's the non-trivial direction in this theorem. Right? So, a couple of implications now, you know, you can just take all these open questions we had about locally testable codes and rephrase them in the language of Cayley graphs and I think they lead to fairly interesting formulations. The question of whether there exist asymptotically good strong LTCs, locally testable codes, is equivalent to asking if there exist Cayley graphs on F2 to the H, where the number of generators is something like 1.1 times H, super linear in H, 
these are something like point 0.1 hy's independent and you want the resulting graph to embed into L1 with constant distortion. And really this is the, you know, this, if you didn't have this distortion condition, then just taking random generators of, the suffi of sufficiently large size would do the trick for you. Like, similarly, this question of whether there exist BCH-like codes, which are locally testable with large distance, in the Cayley graph world, it's asking the following question. Is there a Cayley graph on F2 to the H where the number of generators now is huge, it's exponential in H, where the base of the exponent is allowed to depend on this distance d. The set of generators is dy's independent, and it has a constant distortion embedding into L1. Right? Okay, so in the rest of the 10 minutes or so, I'll give you a sketch of this proof. How do you go from a code to a graph and vice versa? This is easy. The more interesting part is how do you go from a local tester to an L1 embedding and vice versa. And finally, if time permits, you know, then I'll be very surprised and I'll show you some applications. All right? Okay, so any questions at this point? Can you go back on slide one? Uh, yeah. This one's scale. Uh, yeah, so do you want me to just say again what it's asking for? You're asking for a Cayley graph on F2 to the H. The number of generators, well, there's only two to the h elements, but you want it to be like 1.1 to the h or 1.0001 to the h. You want these generators to be dy's independent for some large constant d. That's the best you can hope for with so many generators. And now you want this graph to embed into L1 with constant distortion, right? All right, so let's... Uh, Okay, so first, let me tell you how to go from graphs to codes and vice versa. I'm, su I'm sure that a lot of you see this already, but I'll just tell you. We're starting with a graph where the set of generators is dy's independent. How do you construct a code from it? Well, the code is just going, think of the parity check matrix being these elements S1 through Sn, right? So your set of code words is exactly the set of relations, non-trivial relations that these generators satisfy. You're just considering all x's such that summation xi si equals zero, right? And you know, you can reverse this. You start from a code of distance d, look at its parity check matrix, take those to be the generators of your error correcting, of your Cayley graph, right? So at this point, you know, so this is a pretty straightforward equivalence, in fact, you know, Coding theorists will tell you that this is really the right way to think of an error correcting code. It's n points in a lower dimensional space where any large subset is linearly independent. Okay, so now the question we should ask is what we're trying to embed the shortest path metric in this graph into L1. What does the shortest path metric mean for the code, right? And the shortest path metric here, it corresponds to the quotiented Hamming metric on F2 to the n quotiented by C, right? So if you've not seen this before, you know, I'm just going to define this. It's a very simple notion. So what is Hamming distance, right? You define this notion of Hamming weight for every element, and then you say the distance between x and y is the Hamming weight of x plus y. So now the elements of us, the elements we're interested in are cosets of C. So for every coset, you define weight of that coset, what is a coset? It's just a collection of points, right? It's a shift of the code. Define the weight of that coset to be the minimum weight vector in that uh, coset. And then similarly, you define the distance between x and y to be the weight of x plus y. Okay, so why is this something intuitive from the coding theory point of view? Well, what are cosets really? You should think of them as received words which are grouped by error vectors. So what do I mean by this? Let's say this is our code. Now, when you get a code word from the code, you don't really know that it's error free, right? You know that the error is either zero or it's something else in the code, in the code because there's no way you can tell the difference between these things. But you make the very reasonable assumption that if I get something in the code, there was no error, right? And so for all these received words, you're assuming that the error is the zero vector. You can think of cosets similarly. When I get something from this coset, you know, there's some ambiguity about what the error vector is, but then I look at the minimum weight element in this coset, 
which is sometimes called the coset leader, and I see that this is the error vector. So I was trying to transmit zero, this is what I got. This automatically matches up everything in the coset with a code word by the same error vector. And therefore, this notion of weight of a coset is basically capturing distance of this coset from the code, which is the number of errors that you got when you got something in this coset. Right? So it's a very natural metric, and when you do things like local testing, this is the metric that you care about. So I claim that the shortest part metric in the graph is just the quotiented Hamming metric. So you know, let me just run through the proof, but you know, it's a simple exercise. It's easy to see that each vertex in this graph is actually a coset of C. Corresponds to a coset of C. Here's how you make this correspondence. You're given a vector x in 0, 1 to the n, where n is the number of generators. Now start from 0 and take a walk according to this x. What that means is if xi is equals 1, you cross the edge labeled by si. Go on doing this. Where do you land up? You land up at summation xi si. If xi belongs to the code, then the sum is 0. So you're back to where you started. And otherwise, you know, there's a whole coset which will take you to any vertex in the code. And the shortest part to get to a coset corresponds to exactly the minimum weight vector. Right? So even if you didn't follow this, you know, it's a very simple correspondence. OK. So now, finally, we get down to business. We have this equivalence between codes and Cayley graphs, between the shortest part distance on the Cayley graph and distance from the code. How do L1 embeddings correspond to local testers? We define L1 embeddings as a map into real space. But there's a well-known alternate characterization called the cut cone characterization, which stems really from the fact that we can assume the map is sending you to points in the hypercube appropriately weighted. Right? So what is the cut cone characterization? It says, think of your embedding as a distribution on cuts in the graph. right? It's a cut on the vertex space. And now there is some probability of separating two vertices, which I'll call as row x, y. It's the probability that a cut sampled by this distribution separates these two vertices. Think of this as your approximation to the distance between the vertices x and y. And since this is a probability, we are going to have to allow our scales to rescale graph distances. But the distortion is C if basically you can rescale the distances such that this row x, y is a C approximation to graph distance. Okay. So once you think of L1 as this cut cone characterization, it kind of becomes clear that there should be a connection to local testability. Because after all, what is a local tester? It's just a distribution on dual code words. And each dual code word naturally defines a cut on the vertex set. Right? Just by, you take anything in F2 to the n colon C, just take the inner product of the dual code word, it's going to be either 0 or 1, and that defines a cut in the vertex space. So the, suppose I've given a tester for the code. Now what I'm trying to do is to come up with an L1 embedding, which is a distribution on cuts. And there's no surprises here. I'm just going to use the same distribution that the tester specifies. The claim is that the distortion of this embedding is exactly epsilon over delta. Right? So the proof is really simple. And maybe I should just do it quickly since we are not completely out of time yet. It suffices to consider the pair x, comma 0, the, you know, the origin and some vertex x, just by linearity. The distance between them we've seen is just the weight of the coset x. So what is rho x, y? What is rho x comma 0? It's exactly the rejection probability. Now on one hand, it's lower bounded by delta times the weight of x, just because this is how delta is defined. It's the probability of rejection is at least delta times the distance from the code. But the smoothness condition also tells me that it's upper bounded by epsilon times the weight of x. So why is this? Well, without loss of generality, you can imagine that this x you're thinking about is really the coset leader which has weight, which is this. Since there's only an epsilon chance that you're going to read any of these coordinates, the union bound gives you this upper bound. Right? So therefore, the distortion is epsilon over delta. The more interesting direction is this. Suppose someone gives you an L1 embedding. right? There's no talk of locality here. How are you going to get a local tester out of it? So what is an L1 embedding? It's basically a distribution on cuts on F2 to the n, quotiented out by C. The major problem is that these cuts are not linear. 
if they're linear, you can really think of them as code words in C perp, and you know, for all practical purposes, you'd be done at that point. So when I say you're essentially done, there's still some subtleties here, right? Like because there's no talk of locality at all. Why is this it's some distribution of linear functions? Why is it going to be local? Why is it going to be smooth? Why is it going to have soundness? But it turns out that those things all work out. The crux of the matter is to just get a distribution. Was that for me, Doc? <laughs> the crux of the matter is really to get a distribution on linear functions. Okay? So this is how you do it. You say for, for any distribution d, I can produce another distribution d prime on linear functions, which will give me the same distortion. So this distribution is on functions on f2 to the n quotiented out by c. It's a function on cosets. You can naturally extend this to functions on the entire Boolean cube, right? And uh, okay, the nice thing about doing this is that now the Fourier expansion is supported on dual code words. This is a standard fact from Fourier analysis. So now, whenever the distribution samples f, what you're going to do is to sample from the squared Fourier spectrum, right? So summation f hat alpha squared is one. You can naturally think of it as defining a distribution on linear functions, and you will sample according to this distribution whenever the other distribution samples from f. This will give you your distribution on linear functions. The claim is this can only reduce your distortion, and now this embedding will define your local tester. So this is a bit mysterious, right? Why does this work? So since I'm out of time, I'm just going to give you a quick slide with some intuition. So there's a well-known characterization of distortion in terms of LP duality, which says that you can think of this as a game between two players. The first player produces two distributions, far and near, on pairs of vertices, where far is supported on vertices that are far apart, and near is basically on edges in the graph. The other player produces a cut in the graph. And his goal is to maximize this ratio, which is the probability that you separate a faraway pair divided by the probability that you separate a nearby pair. Right? Since in a graph, these faraway pairs are much further apart, you'd like to be able to produce a cut, which is much more likely to cut a faraway pair. Right? So this is the game. And this kind of characterizes the optimal distortion for a given graph when you're trying to embed it into L1. Now, the nice thing is that the graphs we are dealing with are extremely symmetric. They're vertex transitive. They're really nice graphs. So you can simplify the strategies of both players. You can assume that the first player produces essentially a distribution on displacements. The first vertex is uniformly at random. And then the second vertex in the far distribution is obtained by adding a large weight vector to it from some clever distribution. In the near distribution, you're just adding an EI, an edge to it, by some clever distribution. Right? And because this player is only going to use strategies like this, it's OK for the cut player to use linear functions. Why is that? Well, if you think about distributions like this and think about what is a Boolean function f going to do when presented with a distribution like this, you can see that it's essentially like playing a convex combination of linear functions. Right? So any strategy which you have using a distribution on arbitrary functions, you can get the same payoff using just a distribution on linear functions. OK, I think I'm way over time now. So I'm not going to say anything about applications. But once you have this, you can get a very simple proof of this Kothnow result, which I mentioned earlier. You know, I can't show you the proof, but it's short. It may not be right, but it's short. But now you can reinterpret all the results we have about local testing in terms of L1 embeddability. In particular, this earlier result of Ben Sasson, Harsha, and Raskornikova showing that small dual distance is necessary for local testing is in some sense analogous to the quote now result in the local testing world. But remember, small dual distance is necessary, but it's not sufficient. They even showed that there are codes with small dual distance which are not locally testable. This is particularly interesting, I think, in the embedding world because really dual distance corresponds to spectral gap. So you should think of this result here as an incarnation of the linear London Rabinovich lower bound showing that expanders don't embed into L1. These give you graphs which don't have large spectral gap but which are still hard to embed into L1. 
And again, let me just mention that in this work, we also give an alternate spectral characterization of LTCs, where we say they are equivalent to graphs whose eigenvalue spectrum looks like the epsilon noisy hypercube, which gives a converse to an earlier result with a large fraction of this audience. So let me just conclude by saying that, okay, so what I showed you here is a connection between certain classes of codes and Cayley graphs. There are lots of connections like this already in the literature, like the connection between epsilon bias sets and Cayley expanders. But usually these connections, they relate pseudo-random objects. These are objects which we know they exist. The challenge is more about explicit constructions. Now we are relating objects which, you know, we are not even sure that these things, I don't know if the Yeti exists, but, you know, I can relate it to the existence of the abominable snowman and the Bigfoot and so on and so forth. Yeah? So, you know, it's somehow we are now, I don't know what locally testable codes are, but they are the same thing as Cayley graphs which have good L1 embeddings. I don't know what those are either, but this might be a useful way. You could try to use this to attack the problem of better constructions or even just to prove better lower bounds. You know, we've tried both. We haven't succeeded so far, but my hope is somebody else will. All right, I'm finally done. <laughs> Dual distance or over binary alphabet. So when you just write out the. So you look at dual BCH codes, right? These are kind of generalizations of Hadamard codes. The code words tend to be nearly unbiased. You know, they have weight very close to one half. And in a linear code, if you look at a few coordinates and there's not a short dual code word relating them, you'll just see uniformly random bits. So. Sorry, so maybe I should. Uh, I'm just, well, it's not that easy to find good codes where the dual does not have short code words. And I definitely don't, I'm definitely sure that BCH does, or small alphabets. It's not sure. easy to find good codes where? Where the dual uh, is also good uh, over a small alphabet. Where the dual is also, so when you're saying good, BCH is not good in it's the SM. Or something, right? It's not asymptotic. Either. It's not it's asymptotically good. good. Good, right? I'm thinking of D as constants. So, yeah. in this case, it's dual code words are you know they have extremely good distance. They are like distance close to one half, which means that you can't. Over yeah, over GF two. So they, you can't possibly test these. Questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, let's thank Prakashit again. We'll resume at one.